and it just fell off my belt again. How are you all today? set back there but off my beard got, I got it two very good suggestions uh, today our passage is 2nd Samuel chapter 14 we've been going through 1st and 2nd Samuel since May of last year and we're drudging our way through it. Very interesting passage today. Have you noticed that the, um, the beginning of King David's life, he's, he's good, he can do no wrong, and as he gets older, he starts doing stuff that he shouldn't be doing, and his family starts doing stuff that they shouldn't be doing. And uh, it seems like progressively he's getting worse. And uh, today we have... Uh, a passage that really looks like a soap opera. Go ahead, please. We're ready to move. Uh, there we go. One life to live, that's all we have. And so David finds himself in a real conundrum here. Uh, if you move it ahead there, uh, one, uh, let, let me just briefly give you the context. Uh, Absalom, David's oldest son, had uh, raped his half-sister, uh, Absalom's brother, and uh, Absalom waited two years uh, for the right opportunity and went in and told, you know, actually hired somebody to kill his brother and so David now has a raped daughter and a son who was a murderer and another son who's dead, all in the period of two years. Now, did you ever have a couple bad years? Were they as bad as that? Probably not. And so Absalom, who is, who is uh, after the death of Amnon, um, he is the oldest son and the, basically the heir to the throne of Israel. Uh, this this occurred, you know, about a, th a thousand years B.C. So Absalom runs off to Talmai, the king of Geshur, which is Absalom's grandfather. It's her, his mother's father, because they had made this uh, arrangement where the king from this place uh, gave his daughter to David, and so the idea they would as political marriage to so see that they could keep peace between uh, the two groups. And so we have the death of Tamar, then we have two years until uh, Absalom kills Amnon. Now we have another three years, so it's five years later, uh, where uh, Absalom is with his grandfather in another place. He's banished. So that's the context of the story today. Scene one. Next slide. Second Samuel 14, one. Joab, the son of Zariah, perceived that the king's mind was on Absalom. And it doesn't say this, but I, I believe, because this is the way I would think anyway, how can I make this knowledge work for me? Joab is David's, uh, head of David's army. Uh, Joab is also a cousin. And he sees after this period of time that uh, David wants to bring Absalom back. He misses Absalom. Even though Absalom has done this horrible thing, uh, killed, his, killed his firstborn son, uh, he probably was thinking about it as, well, you know, uh, Amnon did rape Tamar, and so I can understand how, you know, maybe he would be angry enough to kill him. You know, we, we've all heard people say, if anybody does anything to my daughter, they, they don't need to worry about the law. I'll take care of it myself. We all know people that have said that. And so perhaps David was thinking that way, and uh, maybe I should cut Absalom some slack. 
He's not really saying it, but he's thinking it. And Joab has been with him all, basically all his life because they're closely related people. And so he sees that David wants to bring Absalom back from his banishment, which he's been gone for three years. Next slide. I put this in there, in the here, especially for the younger people. Can you read this? You mean? You mean homeschooled people learned how to read cursive? Yes, it, yes, it is. It's cursive. Jesse was the father of Eliah, his firstborn. The second son was. Abinadab the third was Shimea, the fourth was Nathanael, the fifth was Radai, the sixth was Azim, and the seventh was David. Their sisters were Zariah and Abigail. Zariah's three sons were Abishai, Joab, and Ashael. Abigail was the mother of Amasa, who we will see later, uh, whose father was Jether the Ishmaelite. So we see that Joab is actually uh, the nephew of David. And so we have uh, issues between the children of David and Joab is working with David and his brothers in the army with David. So it's a big family affair. It's a big family system. And so Joab, who is the nephew, he, he sees that David wants to bring Absalom back, who is his cousin. And so they, he has a close relationship by blood with both of them. Next slide, please. So Joab sent to Tekoa and brought from there a wise woman. Now this is translated wise, this word is translated wise in most translations, but sometimes it's translated into English crafty. And it can mean skilled, crafty, or wise. And it should be translated skilled in acting because this woman is an actress. Now, in those days, uh, unlike today, I remember when I was a little kid, I remember seeing old men with a black thing on their arm. Anybody remember seeing anybody like that? And I remember even, I'm old enough to remember seeing women dressed completely in black with a hat on with a veil on their face. Stand by the computer for... Oh, the camera is not being run. Folks, we are, we are really with uh, not too much staff here today. Everybody's, everybody's down at Anciala or somewhere else. So, okay, I'll stand in front of the computer. I should have been told that up front. Thank you. So he hires an actress uh, who is, she could have actually, this could have actually been her profession. It doesn't say. But in, the, in ancient times, they would literally hire mourners when somebody died. Uh, it, it, somebody that's not related to the family at all, they would put on their sackcloth and they would put ashes on their head and they would go around crying and weeping and wailing for the dead. And it's, it, was all, it was all a big show for the people that were around. Oh, look at how, look at how many people love the, the, the departed. And it was very common in those days to hire people to pretend to be mourners. Uh, can we see the next slide? Uh, this is a Victorian uh, woman dressed as a, as a mourner. So pretend to be a mourner, put on mourning garments, don't anoint yourself with oil, which is a sign of gladness. Behave like a woman who's been mourning many days for the dead. Now, Joab is, is a little bit sneaky. He's already discussed with David, obviously. We see, you know, the reading between the lines. He's already discussed with David about bringing Absalom back. But David is saying, no, I don't want to see him. I don't want to see him ever again. But in his heart, he wishes to see his son. And so Joab is thinking, this is between the lines, too. I can make David happy, and I can set myself up good with 
Absalom, because he's the heir to the throne. He's now the oldest, um, so he'll be king next. And so Absalom will be happy that I brought him back. David will be happy that I, I fixed it. And politically, I'm going to be in a good, good shape for the change of the guard because David's getting older and he's, someday he's going to be gone and Absalom will be king. And Absalom's my cousin and he'll be my friend and I'll still be in charge of the army and everything will be cool. Kind of like politics today. Now, you say, how do I know that? Well, that's the way I think. You know, we've got situations where um, we have to position ourselves in a good spot. And so that's what Joab is trying to do. So he hires this mourning woman. Next slide, please. Go to the king and speak to him as follows. And Joab put the words into her mouth. I don't know if you can see that. It's not a very good picture, but the last... The last line in this script is, I've got a feeling we're not in Kansas anymore. And so you know the movie that this comes from. I assume you do. So Joab writes the script for this woman to say. He's the producer of this movie or of this soap opera or whatever it is. So she comes. What's your trouble? Alas, I'm a widow. My husband is dead. Your servant had two sons, they fought, oh, I moved over too far there, at least on my slide, with one another in the field. There was no one to part them, and one struck the other and killed him. So, she has one child left, the other one has been murdered, her husband is dead in an age and day where there was no such thing as welfare, uh, there was no such thing as uh, Social Security retirement or anything like that. And so if this other son is, is punished with a death penalty, she will absolutely have nothing. Now this is reminiscent of the first couple chapters in the Bible. You know, the first three or four chapters that you read when you were 11, and then you got to that chapter with that long list of names, and that was as far as you got in the Bible. You remember that? Well, before you got to that long list of names in the first book in the Bible, you have Adam and Eve, and they have two sons, and one son kills the other. And if you follow the story, um, the they came for, they said about Cain, you know, he's killed his brother and he deserves to die. And God says to, to them, if anybody kills Cain, then uh, the punishment will come upon them sevenfold. And Cain goes off and says, ah, you know, I'm good. You can't touch me because if you do, you'll be uh, punished sevenfold. And so in this case where the one brother killed the other, uh, God let him off the hook. And yet he had a mark on him, and wherever he went, he had, it's called the mark of Cain, and, and this is what we, we see with people who have committed murder and are doing long terms in prison. They've got this, this burden on their heart for what they have done, you know, this guilt for what they have done. And so this is a fictitious story. But she, bring, she brings it up because Joab has put her... Um, thank you. Joab has put her... Let there, let there be light. <laughs> He's put her up to this. So she comes before David, who is the king and judge, and she presents this story. Uh, she needs his help to save her son from being executed. Next slide, please. Uh, verse 7. The whole family has risen against your servant. They say, give up the man who struck his brother so that we may kill him for the life of his brother whom he murdered, even if we destroy the heir as well. Thus they would quench my one remaining ember and leave my husband neither name nor remnant on the face of the earth. In other words, we need to make an exception here for my boy. Because the law of Moses says very clearly, murderer shall be put to death. But she comes and she says to David, if, if he's put to death, I'm going to have nobody and I'm going to have a double grief 
And not only that, my husband will have no heir, and he, you know, his line will not continue on the earth, which was, you know, about the worst thing that could happen in their culture and in their way of thinking. And so she pulls on David's heartstrings. Now, what does the law say? Next slide, please. I, I'm not going to take the time to read it to you because it's a whole chapter, but basically, it gives the uh, Numbers chapter 35 gives the law concerning murder. What is premeditated murder? What is the punishment? What is unintentional murder? What is the punishment? What is required to convict? Now, in this case, this this uh, fictitious person that she is uh, presenting to the king, this person could not be convicted under biblical law because it required two or three witnesses. Nobody could be convicted without, even on the testimony of an eyewitness, they could not be convicted because the eyewitness might lie and therefore an uh, innocent person might be put to death for a lie. And so it required two and at best three people who see it. It's like this thing, did you see this thing with Selman Rushke the other day? He's the guy, this is a, not in the sermon, but he's the guy uh, that uh, wrote the satanic verses. And they put a, I think it's called a fatwa. The Muslim put a fatwa on him, which meant that if anybody kills him, they'll give him, they'll give him a, it was a lot of money. I forgot what it was. This was years and years ago. Well, somebody came and tried to kill him at Chautauqua a couple days ago. Walked up to him, stabbed him a whole bunch of times, nearly killed him. And uh, that would be two, two or three, talk about two or three witnesses of a whole group of people that were there and saw it happen. So under biblical law, if, if this uh, author died, then under biblical law, he would be deserving of death because he did it open and notoriously in front of a whole lot of people. But in this case, in this fictitious case, the two boys are in the field and nobody else is around. There's nobody there to pull the one boy off the other, she says. And so therefore, he, he literally could not be convicted according to the law. But he would be banished. And when somebody, you know, commits a murder and it can't be, you know, he can't be uh, punished by death, then there were, there were, I think, six cities which that person could run to. So it doesn't really line up completely with the biblical law. And really, if, if David had looked at the biblical law, he could not have convicted him. But David wants to let him off the hook anyway. Now, David here pardons somebody, and there's nothing in the law of Moses that gives the king or leader the right to pardon anybody. But from earliest times, leaders of countries have pardoned people who have committed crimes. And everybody gets really upset uh, at the end of a president's uh, tenure. They, they get out the pen and they pardon a whole bunch of people. Every president has done this in, the la in recent history. Uh, and the people that are in prison in New York State, they're waiting for the governor's pardon to get them out because they've created some heinous crime. And they think that my only chance to get out is uh, to get a governor pardon or a presidential pardon. And here's a picture of a uh, pardon from Gerald Ford. I was hoping to get the one where he pardoned Rich Richard Nixon. but I. I just got an or I don't know who this guy was he pardoned, but uh, apparently he got off the hook. Go, go to your house, I'll give orders. What's missing here? Here, pardon is being offered without repentance. Absalom, I'm just telling you so that you know, even if you read ahead, Absalom never has a change of heart. He's not sorry for what he did at all. Go to your house. 
And the woman says, on me be the guilt. She knows that what David is doing is not right, but on me be the guilt and on my father's house. Let the, let the king and his throne be guiltless. Well, the king and his throne consist of himself and Joab, both killers, both murderers as well. Does she have the authority to pronounce David guiltless, the man who, who stole a guy's wife and sent him into battle to die and, and took her as his own wife? Or Joab, who killed uh, the, the uh, leader of uh, the nation of Israel when they were trying to bring things together and he did nothing wrong, he just, he was politically motivated. He didn't want him in the new army with the two, the two countries that took to, to, together and so he killed. Joab was a killer. David was a killer. And they excused themselves. You know, we're pretty good at pardoning our own sins. What do you think? Oh, what I did was not so bad. Well, let the king and his throne be guiltless. Next slide, please. If anyone says anything to you, bring him to me. He shall never touch you again. Then she said, please, may the king keep the Lord your God in mind so that the avenger of blood may kill no more. They, they had a guy or guys whose job was to put murderers to death. You know, we, we used to have what they called hangmen uh, before the days of electrocution and lethal injection. And their job was whenever somebody needed to be hanged, uh, they would call the hangman, somebody who didn't care, and the hangman would be, he would be covered. So I assume it was a he, we don't know that, but uh, all, all anybody would see is the eyes and the, the body, and nobody knew who actually would pull the lever that would cause the hanging. But that was their job, and they would travel from place to place. And it happened here in Candagua. And the, the gibbet, the, the hanging mechanism, the engine of hanging is over in Genesee County in the museum. They, they, they would sp spread it around. Okay, you need, the, you need the, uh, the murder or the execution engine, we'll send it over by horse. And so in those days, they had people that were called the avenger of blood, and that was their job. If somebody killed, then they would just go around and, and find them and take them out. And so she, okay, uh, David, I'm glad that you said it's okay, but I want you to give orders to the avenger of blood not to come around. Okay, not one hair of your son shall fall to the ground. This is all made up story. Are there any made up stories in the Bible? Here's an example of a made up story in the Bible, but it tells you it's a made up story. Then the woman said, next slide please, please let your servant speak a word. And he said, speak. The woman said, why have you planned such a thing against the people of God? Here's, this woman is brave. In giving this decision, the king convicts himself in as much as the king does not bring back his banished one home again. I would submit to you that this is apples and oranges. But it worked. You know why it worked? Because David already wanted to bring him back. And he heard what he wanted to hear. You know, I think I'd be a little angry if somebody came, pulled his trick on, gave me a fake story, and brought me around and said that I had to do what she wanted me to do. But David is happy. He doesn't criticize her at all. Hey, you're right. I need to bring him back. Now, this presents a problem. And I'll show you what it is. Next verse. We must all die don't like that. We are like water spilled on the ground, which cannot be gathered up. 
but God will not take away a life. He will devise plans so as not to keep an outcast banished forever from his presence. True or false? So here's a piece of theology right here. This is Joab's theology. He gave her, he gave her the script. True or false? True about the water, okay. Uh, we'll, all, we'll all agree with that. That's quite a metaphor, actually. He will devise plans so as not to keep an outcast banished forever from his presence. True or false? God will not take a life. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. No, 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 no. God's not like that. This is the same discussion that we have in society in the United States in the 21st century. Oh, God's good. He loves everybody. It doesn't matter what they do. No. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. There has to be law and order. There must be justice. People must be punished for what they do. Come on now, what do you have to say about this? He does Pardon me? He does banish and he does and does take lives. There are many instances in the Bible where prophets come, thus saith the Lord. You need to you need to get the mic because you know we are recording this and people at home are probably saying, What's she saying? Sorry. He said there are many instances in the Bible where God sends prophets and says your life will end today and you know scripture tells us that people will be banished and cast into hell you know that, that that's that's what teaches us that's the whole point of Christ's salvation is that so we're not banished well didn't Jesus even say the thing the man had all kinds of wealth and he needed to build bigger barns and uh, he built the barns and then God your life says, is done today thou fool your life is over yep. today and then who will spend your money the government. Yeah. More in some states than the others. Florida's the big one. You know, they don't they don't tax you too much when you're alive, but when you when you're gone, they really get you. Opposite here, they tax you when you're alive, and not so much when you're gone. Ananias and Sapphira, they lied to the Holy Spirit where they were gone. Herod, King Herod. I'm talking New Testament stuff now. Herod is in the, on his seat, and the people say, it's the voice of a god. And uh, he, yeah, I'm a god. And then all of a sudden, he's eaten by worms, which probably means he had some sort of intestinal cancer or something like that and died. You can't, you can't come against God. In fact, it says in the law that if, if ever the, the person committed murder and the the Israelite nation did not bring the capital punishment that God would come after that person and keep after them and after them to punish them. So which God are we talking about? Oh, we're talking about the same one. The thing that's missing here in Absalom is repentance. David, when he did his deed, he turned and he was sorry and he fasted and he prayed and I'll never do it again and I've sinned against God and I've sinned against God only. Joab on the other hand when he killed, was it Amasa? I forgot who he killed. Uh, the uh, captain of the other army. No repentance whatsoever. Absalom kills his brother. No repentance whatsoever. But here this woman who is a play actor who is getting her theology from Joab who himself has not repented. God's not like that. He's making, God's making plans to bring you back. He, he knows how to, how to do, how to bring people back. Now that's, that part is true, 
but there's some responsibility on the person who has done wrong to turn from that. It says in Ezekiel that, you know, there might be a righteous man and he's doing righteous and he will live, but if he changes and starts to do evil, then he'll die. And there might be an evil person who does all kinds of things, but later in life turns from it and starts to do the right thing, he will live. I mean, this is how the Bible places it in the prophets. So, uh, I give this a partly true, but not the full truth. Next slide, please. The king will hear and deliver his servant from the hand of the man who would cut both me and my son off. Your servant thought, the word of my lord the king will set me at rest, for my lord the king is like the angel of God, discerning good and evil. The Lord your God be with you. So she gives him the blessing. Okay, you've made the right choice, David. Next slide. The king answered the woman. Do we have a pencil? Oh, good, perfect. Uh, Do not withhold from me anything I ask. The woman said, let my Lord the king speak. The king said, is the hand of Joab with you in this? He figured it out. The woman answered, As surely as you live, my lord the king, one cannot turn from the right or from the left from anything that the lord my king has said, for it was your servant Joab who commanded me, and it was he who put all these words into the mouth of your servant. In order to change the course of affairs, your servant Joab did this, but my lord has wisdom like the wisdom of the angel of God to know all things that are on the earth. Suck up. Oh, you're so wonderful. You're so smart. You figured this out. You know what's going on. And would, would this verse 20, would this be accepted as testimony by Judge Judy? He did this because. He wanted to change things for the better. Doubtful. We'll see in passages ahead. Very doubtful. He's trying to position himself for the next generation of kings. Next one, please, Jonah. Scene two. And again, next slide. We've moved to another place. The king said to Joab, very well, I'll grant this. Go bring back the young man, Absalom. Joab prostrated himself with his face to the ground and did obeisance and blessed the king. And Joab said, today your servant knows I found favor in your sight. My lord, the king, in that the king has granted the request of his servant. So Joab went off to Geshur and brought Absalom to Jerusalem. I don't want to let too much out of the bag here, but this was this this was bad. You know why it was bad? Because Absalom has this burning anger in him. Because when Absalom's half brother Amnon raped his full sister. David never punished him for that. He does not like his father because he feels that David should have done something to Amnon and he didn't and Absalom felt he had to kill his brother uh, for the honor of his sister. And so he does not like his father. And we're going to see some things happen in the next episodes of the One Life to Live problems that are going to result because of this. Then the last, last one, second to last one. The king said, let him go to his own house. He's not to come into my presence. So Absalom went into his own house. He did not come into the king's presence. So he's living down the street in Jerusalem, which was much, much smaller in those days. 
and he's living there, but he cannot come into the presence of the king because the king is still furious with him for killing his other son, and there's still problems in the family, and he's living in town, and never the twain shall meet. Next slide. Now the editor here gives us some information that we didn't know before. In all Israel, there was no one to be praised so much for his beauty as Absalom. Anybody know who this is? Yeah, Fabio. He's, he's like the, the most manly guy in the world. He's probably old now. His beauty was from the sole of his foot. Can you imagine that? He has beautiful feet. Have you ever seen people's feet? They got toenail fungus on them. From, from his feet to his head, no blemish. Not a pimple on the guy. When he cut, off his, cut the hair off his head at the end of every year, when it was heavy on him, he cut it. He weighed the hair of his head 200 shekels by the king's weight. I, I think this has got to be, you know, an exaggeration to say, you know, a big pile of hair. How much hair does he have? Oh, mega hair. He's good looking. He's smart. He's cunning. He's ruthless. He's angry. And everybody likes him. You know, this description of Absalom is the same description of Saul, the previous king. He was head and shoulders above everybody else, and he was good looking, and all the women liked him. It's like almost exactly the same description of Absalom. And he, not only that, he is in the next in line to be the king's uh, crown prince because he is the oldest living son of David. And everybody thinks he's cool. They don't care that he killed somebody. People don't care what Hillary did. Do they care that she, you know, burned her phone and cleaned her computer? Those that support her don't care. Those that don't support the former President Trump? Those that do support him? Uh, I don't believe that. He couldn't have done that. Jim, equal, opportun equal opportunity describer here. When, when some politician is, is smooth, smoothing you, and they agree with what you think, you don't care what their personal life is like in general. Now, of course, that's not true for all. You like Trump, you defend him. You like uh, Barack Obama, you defend him. You know, what do you mean he gave all the, Obama gave all those guns to the Mexicans? No, we don't care. And Trump, he had, confidential national secrets in Del, is it Del Largo, is that what it is? That's what they've accused him of now. Oh, they're gonna, they're gonna get him. Even if he did it, we don't care. No big deal, Hillary had all the stuff on the computer, they didn't do anything to her. What I'm trying to make a point here is that Absalom was liked and he knew it. And deep inside his heart, he knows that he's going to be the next king. And then the next slide. It's a little editorial that the, the scribe or the compiler, the chronicler, whoever it was, put this together. They were born to Absalom three sons, a daughter whose name was Tamar, and she was a beautiful woman. Of course she was a beautiful woman. Her father was a beautiful man. 
and her mother was a beautiful woman. And they were both princes and princesses of different countries. Good breeding. He's in the place to take over for his father. Now, let's pass that microphone around. We see that Gene is not here. He's in Kentucky. Keith isn't feeling good because he hurt his back. And uh, Caleb isn't here because he's down in uh, on Ciala for the Rotary Camp. And so the three main talkers, <laughs> except for Rick, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Rick and Paul are here. So uh, let's. Uh, what do you have to say? Yeah, I think, you know, thinking that you can skirt the law without consequence is, is the beginning of real self-deception and delusion to me. But I think you referenced Ezekiel as well. Uh, Ezekiel says, do I have any pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the Lord God, rather that he should turn from his ways and live. But the people say, oh no, the way of the Lord is not right. So, you know, in, with recent events over the last couple, two, three years, and riots and all this stuff, you, you had better be real careful about your demanding of justice. Um, for yourself. <laughs> you know, if, if, if you are a, a bit delusional and unrepentant, and, but you want justice for others, uh, you want penalties put upon others, be careful about what you ask for. Uh, it, it may return to you unless you're repentant. That's, uh, that, that's Ezekiel 18, I think you were talking about where, you know, the righteous who turns from his righteousness and commits, he's, he's going he's gonna to be, <laughs> he will die. <laughs> yeah, thank you for uh, pointing out where that is. And thank you for pointing out that the pleasure of God is not to punish, that people might turn and live. I saw another hand somewhere. Was that you, Paula, or are you just saying that you're usually the talker? <laughs> oh, okay. And yeah, can I give you a verse in yeah. Proverbs sure. that speaks to this? Proverbs 24. I just read this this morning before I came to church. 24.10, if you are slack in the day of distress, distress your strength is limited. Deliver those who are being taken away to death and those who are staggering to slaughter. Oh, hold them back. If you say, see, we didn't know this, does he not consider it who weighs the hearts? And does he not know it who keeps your soul? And will he not render to man according to his work? Thank you, Rick. Okay, today is the day that we take communion, that being the second Sunday of the month. And so if you're a believer, uh, we invite you to the communion table uh, with us. And uh, at this